Shama Maher, CEO of Scaling Retail, and we are coming to you from West Coast Craft here in downtown LA. Now, what's so interesting about these type of fair is that not only do you have to plan six months in advance, or should you be planning far in advance to participate, but as you're starting to plan and look at what this pop-up or what this craft fair might mean for you, you want to pay attention to some of these mechanics. It's not just as quite as simple as showing up and making sure that you're able to sell just off the bat. It takes quite a bit of planning and preparation to make sure that something like this is successful for you. Now, some of these mechanics include things like how are you going to plan your inventory? What kinds of customer service or staffing do you need to have? And then certainly, what is your merchandising strategy going to actually look like? When we think about inventory planning, a lot of this is going to be predicated on the kind of booth that you have. Are you working with rolling racks? Are you working with different levels of shelving? Or do you have a table? What is going to be the best infrastructure for your products that you're going to be showcasing? When you think about inventory, if you're flying in from out of town, chances are you're going to be shipping boxes over here and possibly keeping them in your car or even in the back of your booth. If you're thinking about this when you're just participating locally, chances are it's just going to be in your car and you probably won't have to worry about shipping costs. But guys, shipping is something you're going to want to plan for when it comes to inventory. Chances are, if you're looking at strategic POSs or markdowns, your prices should be priced to sell. Meaning, you're looking at taking discounts anywhere from 10 to 50% off, and chances are you might even be looking at having sample sales. Now, all of that is going to really help you understand how much inventory you're going to bring. These kinds of events are strategically positioned to take advantage of fast-moving product. So, if you have a POS or a markdown that you're planning on taking, make sure that you're actually carrying more of that product as we actually plan to be able to sell through more of that. Plan to take lower discounts on the product you have new for the season and don't plan to bring as much of it because, guys, these places are meant to turn product over quickly. Now, when we turn our attention to staffing and who needs to be behind the booth, you as a founder and business owner, it's very critical and important that you're there. Oftentimes, we have brands that are showing up with just customer service people or sales associates, but guess what? The passion in the heart of the brand just doesn't quite come through unless it's one of the founders or someone who's been a part of your company for a long time. So how many people is too many people? Again, take a look at the size of your booth and understand that at any given moment, you're probably gonna wanna have two people on site. One of those people is gonna be there kind of staffing and walking around. Maybe they're out there talking to people, getting them to come in. And someone else who's also gonna be focused on backfilling inventory and rigging up the POS. Plus guys, if someone has to pee, who's gonna man the booth? So you wanna make sure that you have at least two different people at all times who are going to be manning your booth. Now, the last thing when it comes to how your displays are set up, merchandising is such an important key element. Unlike a brick and mortar store where you have so much control over lighting, the scent of a space, even the music of the space, here at West Coast Craft, the sky is determined by itself on the day. Today we were expecting it to be raining, but guess what? It wasn't. The music, certainly not dictated by the brands. When we think about the smell of this place, well, hey, it's LA, so it smells what it smells like. So given that you have not too many options here on how to be able to physically control the space, you really have to go inside and say, okay, my little eight by 10 booth, how do I make that feel like it is my own private shop? What kinds of strategies can you actually do to help create that? Number one, we take a look at big, bold signage, right? Whether that is a big banner of your store, whether that's the icon of your brand, you wanna make sure it's recognizable. The little tiny placards that these craft fairs have to put on your tents are not simply enough to be able to give someone the right feel or even to understand what your brand is actually about. So make sure you have some storytelling capabilities built in. The next thing, really think about custom made infrastructure. I'm talking about little beautiful wooden built bookcases or places where you're gonna be able to display your product in a way that's gonna be highly unique and special. In fact, one of the companies that we interviewed introduced a collaboration this weekend for the first time in the form of planters. So beautiful, so interesting, and really helped to guide the eye, not only from the ground, but all the way up as she was able to support that with some better signage and product against the back wall of her tent. Other things to consider when you're doing merchandising. Well, given that you can't control the light and you may wanna consider having in lighting to be able to highlight certain things like jewelry, right? So make sure you have little strategic lights. The other thing that was very important were things like fitting rooms. If product is meant to be tried on and you do not have a space for someone to try it on, you better believe it's gonna be harder to convert. So make sure that you have a little tiny cordoned off section in order for people to try things on. 
The other thing that we saw that was kind of a miss in certain places, the lack of mirrors. I can guarantee guys, even though I don't mind taking a selfie to see how a hat fits on me, it's always a better idea to be able to have a mirror so you can, again, easily convert the sale. Lastly, any sort of storytelling elements that you can weave in, whether you are a sustainable brand and you have pictures of the leather or you're really showcasing the leather, or if you're telling a story through other kinds of visual props, make sure that you're filling your space not just with product, but you're also filling it with key defining elements of your brand. Now, one of the most interesting things that we found here when it comes to merchandising is really the experiential and interactive ways in which customers can really touch and feel and get to live within the brand. We've seen interesting things from having a truck lined up with a tent, as well as other brands who have taken full on experiential takeovers. And guys, experiential is the main thing that we're seeing here. Not only are you in an experience walking through these different rows, the brands that were fully able to integrate what they stood for in terms of building out the infrastructure, the colorways, the walls, um, and really creating an entire experience is certainly something that we see continuing to be a huge trend as consumers look to find ways to take home that brand and to be able to be a part of that during that day. All right, guys, that's all from us here at Scaling Retail. Whether this is your first pop-up or your third craft fair, we are here to help you merchandise, strategize, and capacity build so you can take advantage of opportunities like these in order to really help scale up your business and be profitable. Send us an email at hello at scalingretail.com and come check out our resources on YouTube and our blog for more ideas on how to scale up and grow your company. Thanks so much. Bye.